No one quite understood the clapping at the beginning. You don't know how good it's going to be yet. <laughs> Can only go downhill. Oh. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, so when uh, when Bill and uh, Derek asked me to do a talk uh, here tonight, um, I thought uh, what I could talk about. And I, I remembered I'd done a talk called Being Lazy before. And being lazy, I thought I'd do the same talk again. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite the same talk because that was two and a half hours long. So uh, <laughs> I've condensed it a little bit. So I'll talk really fast. Um, Okay, oh, now that's not a good start. Wakey, wakey. Here we are. So I looked up uh, laziness in the dictionary and came up with not inclined to work or exertion. And uh, this talk is a bit about uh, lazy evaluation in Haskell. Uh, people know what lazy evaluation in Haskell is? Just sort of quick show of hands. People know basically what laziness is. Could, okay, I'll go home then. Um, this talk is really not going to be talking too much depth about laziness and how it works and all that kind of stuff. What I'm really interested in is about how we can utilize laziness to allow us to write programs differently from how we potentially would uh, if we didn't have laziness. And uh, the sort of being lazy is a bit of a sort of double, double meaning in that uh, as lazy programmers, we want to do less work. And therefore, if we can rely on the laziness in the uh, implementation of Haskell, then potentially that can allow us to do less work or not, but we'll see. So I'm going to talk very briefly about evaluation in Haskell. Um, there are people in this room who know far more about this subject than I do. Um, so I'm going to talk very, very briefly about it, just to give a bit of background. I'm going to focus on some uh, examples of using laziness and talk a very little bit about some of the issues and pitfalls that you come across working in a lazily evaluated language rather than an eagerly evaluated language. And then probably about half of the talk is going to be a, a worked example and I'm going to go through lots of code because I like code. If you've been to any of my Hoodlum sessions, you'll know I just write code, but I did actually prepare some code tonight rather than writing it on the fly. Bit of a chicken, really. Um, this talk is actually a reworking of a talk I've done before. Um, I did it uh, two years ago with uh, Ben Mosley. And uh, one of the things that Ben really wanted to stress, and I, I, I agree with this, so I thought I'd put it in here as well, is that... Uh, the power of Haskell comes from a number of different things. And top of our list was purity. We like Haskell because it's pure. It gives us this uh, pure evaluation, which means we can reason about our code a lot more than we can in an impure language. And the second thing we liked about Haskell was the type system, the, the uh, safety that the type system gives us, and the power and expressiveness of that type system. And the third thing we liked was laziness. But this talks about laziness, so we'll concentrate on that particular piece. We also like the rich syntax and the very sophisticated optimizer and the extensibility of the, of the environment. And of course, the extensive libraries that come with Haskell. But uh, this, this uh, laziness is the, kind of the third thing on our list. We think the other two things are more important, but this is, is good. And the more we play with Haskell, the more we just use laziness without thinking about it. Until we start programming in other languages and get confused about why things behave differently. So I'm going to start by talking about non-strictness. I'm sorry about the style sheet for these slides. Um, I was going to put a better style sheet together, but I'm a bit lazy, so I didn't. Um, so I'm going to show you something. This is, this is talking about sort of Java or sort of more, more traditional languages. So in, in Java, we might have a, a function max, and we call it with two expressions, x plus 5 and y plus 5. And the x plus 5 and the y plus 5 are evaluated before the, uh, the, um, uh, the max is evaluated, or the, the, uh, the, the values of, of x plus 5 and y plus 5 are passed to max. Uh, but in a, a slightly different area in the language, you might have an expression like this Boolean expression here. And in this case, the um, right-hand side of the, of, the amp, of, the, of the AND is not uh, necessarily evaluated beforehand, or you, you uh, can have a, a, an invalid, um, excuse me, you can have, uh, you don't need to know the, the, the value of that in order to be able to calculate the whole expression. If the left-hand side turns out to be true, then it doesn't matter whether the right-hand side is true or false or can't even be evaluated. That's, that's the point. So we, we see this, uh, this um, uh, called short-circuit evaluation in, in Java, um, where, they, uh, where some operators only evaluate, uh, need to evaluate one side before the operator. But, so, but that's not how it works with function calling. And if we, if we write a, a function foo, and I don't know whether this Java syntax is correct, but it seems vaguely correct, um, we uh, can write a function foo that takes two integers, uh, x and z, and says uh, if uh, uh, x doesn't equal zero, then uh, we 
uh, then we, we're going to evaluate the, the, the uh, z greater than zero uh, piece. And if we call this with uh, zero and three divided by zero, then we get a bit of a problem. Because even though inside the function we don't actually need the value of z because of the short circuit of the AND, that short circuiting doesn't permeate outside of the function. We can't write our own functions in Java that short circuit. So in Haskell, uh, we could have a function max, and we could pass uh, x plus 5 and y plus 5 to it, and that's fine. And we can have a, um, the ampersand ampersand that works in the same way. And we can write our foo function uh, exactly the same. And in this case, we can pass the uh, three div 0. We're talking about integers here, so this is integer division, um, which would give us a, a, an error. But because of the, um, the, the 0 case, the, the, because x is zero, it doesn't evaluate the right-hand side, or it doesn't doesn't need the value of the right-hand side. And this this uh, property is actually not really laziness. This is this is called non-strictness. This just allows us to have um, values in our language, which are which or, or expressions in our language which which are uh, errors, but because they're not required to produce a result, this doesn't cause us a problem. And you could uh, evaluate this in an eager manner. Manner you could evaluate the x plus 5 first and the y plus 5 first and pass it to max, or in the bottom line we could evaluate the um, 3 div 0 and store that as some error value. And we could pass that error value into the function, and the function could then ignore that error value and return a perfectly valid result. So that would be an example of uh, uh, utilizing non-strictness, because we've got an error that, that doesn't permeate out, but it's not laziness because we're actually evaluating the uh, 3 divided by 0 first. thing that non-strictness allows us to do is to put, um, as well as pass error values into, into functions, we can also put error values into, uh, into data structures as well. So this is a list that contains the, the head of an empty list, which if you tried accessing that would cause you an error. Now, that, because in this particular expression, we're completely ignoring that third element of the list, it doesn't matter that we have a, 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 an error value in there. We can still value out, a useful value out. Does that make sense? Yes? Good. So what's lazy evaluation give us on top of non-strictness? Well, it allows us to do um, expressions like this. So we have this doubling function, which given a, a value a, will return a list of a followed by a doubling of a times 2. So when we take the first nine elements of that uh, doubling of 3, we get that list at the bottom returned. Now, if we were had a language which was non-strict but was eagerly evaluated, this would cause us a problem because we'd have to evaluate the whole of the list which would keep recursing into the doubling, doubling, doubling. And if we needed to do that before we took nine elements off the list, then we wouldn't be able to get any values back because we'd never be able to finish. Make sense? Good. So, before we move on to some examples, do we have a some sort of mental model of how evaluation happens in Haskell. My, my, my mental model is probably fairly um, inaccurate and weak, but I kind of think about the idea in here of this uh, take nine of doubling, sort of working sort of from the, from the outside in. So you can think about the fact, well, okay, we need, to, we need a result here. Well, what's the release result going to be? Well, take nine, that needs uh, to have a list uh, returned. So we're going to get some uh, cons node returned and it's going to have some funk in the left-hand side and some funk in the right-hand side. These are unevaluated expressions in the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And now we need to print out the first element, so we'll need the three, the three. so we'll have to evaluate the left-hand funk, funk, but we've still got the right-hand one is still a funk. And now we need to evaluate the next, um, next node, which is again the cons node. So if you think about sort of evaluation from the top down, as you need to pull values out, these funks get expanded into code. That's the, that's the sort of extent of my model of... Of, of lazy evaluation. Does that anything like the reality? Close enough? <laughs> so what does this give us? What does it allow us to do? Well, for example, if we wanted to um, uh, print a list of names with uh, each one having an index next to it, we could use this code. So our print names gets given a list of names, and we zip with the printf function, and we've got this infinite list here, this one dot dot list here. Now we could of course write this as one dot dot length of names and we could have a fixed length list but 
you know, as lazy programmers, why do we need to do that? So we can just have an infinite list and it just pulls off the values that it requires from the list. So it allows us to be uh, a bit more uh, relaxed about how we write this. And also potentially it's more efficient because we don't have to evaluate certain uh, elements of the list. Um, we, we don't have to sort of count the names before we um, start printing them out. So using this infinite list rather than one dot dot length of names is probably slightly more efficient. Maybe, yes? Not sure. But it feels more elegant anyway to be able to write it like this. Some people hate that, of course. So another example here. So um, I like this one. If I wanted to take the sum of the top 50 elements of a 500,000 element list, how would I write that? Well, if you think about how you'd have to do that imperatively, you'd have to sort of keep a, a, a sort of list of 50 values and you'd have to sort of search through the list and, and if your value is greater than the smallest value in your list, in your, in your collection, you sort of collect them up and at the end you've collected the, the 50 biggest values and then you take the sum, of, the sum of that list. I think that's probably how I'd do it in an imperative uh, language. But why can't we just write this? Why can't we just say sort my list, uh, take the, 50, uh, the first 50 elements and then sum them? I didn't find what I meant by top, but what I meant was the smallest ones in this case. <laughs> uh, and so the question is, uh, how does that evaluate? Does that really evaluate lazily? Does it evaluate quickly? So I did some tests, and I got these results. So if I just sum my list of uh, 50,000 elements, it takes me 0.16 seconds in GHCI on this machine. Not this machine, different machine actually, but a machine of similar power. Um, if I sum the first 50 elements of a list, it takes, well, according to that, no time at all. It probably is actually more than no time at all, but it's close enough to no time at all. So that, that tells me that actually it does take a bit longer to sum a, uh, uh, the, the, the big list than it does the smaller list. So then I say, well, what if I sum the sorted list? Well, in that case, it takes 2.32 seconds. So to sort the entire list and add them up, takes 2.32 seconds. But if I do what I did on the previous slide, just take the first 50 elements, sorry, sort the list, take the first 50 elements and sum them up, it only takes 0.31 seconds. So it's clearly not having to do the entire sort before it's able to, um, to, uh, to take the first 50 and, and add them up, which I thought was pretty cool. of things we can do is we can write cyclic definitions. Um, so I showed you uh, previously the, um, the, the doubling function. So given a value uh, A, uh, put, uh, so, so the task here is to generate a list of powers of two. So we can do this by using the doubling function that I showed you earlier. So, um, and then we just call that with one. So one is our seed and then we just get the, the dub doubling as we go along. The other way we can write that is with the expression below. So the difference here, I believe, technically, I'm not very good on these technicalities, but I think the first is called recursion, the second is called co-recursion. OK, just thought I might get somebody say, oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> um, but uh, it's sort of, one is sort of inside out of the other. One is sort of giving a value and then sort of going down and sort of building the list from the top, whereas the other one's kind of assuming the list is already there, you know, working out the list is already there. And do, do people understand this code? This kind of makes sense? Is that how you'd write it? Is it how you'd write it now? <laughs> and you've probably seen examples of doing a similar thing with the uh, Fibonacci series using the, the uh, memoization to, to, to do this. This is a very uh, common example in Haskell. So that's one form of cyclic definitions. The uh, second example is uh, create two values that refer to each other. So we've got a, um, a data type cat, and a cat has a, a name and a victim, and a data type mouse, and a mouse has a name and a tormentor. Uh, and the first one, the, the victim is of type mouse, and the tormentor is of type cat. And we create these two uh, values, Tom is a cat, uh, whose uh, victim is Jerry, and Jerry is a mouse whose tormentor is Tom. And we can use, uh, 
can obviously use Tom here because it's written after this, but we can also use Jerry up here, even though before we've defined it. Yeah, so we, it's, there's no kind of ordering. This is not an imperative, set this thing up, then set this thing up. They can just refer to each other. And you can't do that sort of thing in, um, uh, in, in a... Um, can't do that in an eagerly evaluate. Can you do it in a... Is it about, not, about non-strictness or laziness? Not really sure. Non-strictness, I think. Don't know. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, this is not something you can do in Java. In Java, what you'd have to do is create a, a, a data structure with a kind of an empty, empty pointer and then kind of fill it in, fill it in afterwards. And I, I, I kind of like this. Don't find much use for it, but I kind of like it anyway. And then the last uh, example I'm going to talk about in, in laziness is lazy I.O. So suppose we wanted to read lines from a large file and reverse all the characters of each line and write, write the result to a new file. And then we would perhaps write it like this. We would just say, uh, read the whole file um, and then uh, break it up into lines, uh, reverse each of those lines, put the whole file back together again, and then write the output. And if we did that in, in Java, it would read the whole file into memory and it would uh, then have to break the whole thing up in memory and, and do this. But because we're doing this in, in, in a lazily evaluated language, it actually only reads the file in chunks and processes chunks as it goes. As it needs to write stuff out, it starts pulling stuff in. And you can run this and find out, and you can do profiling and see that, that I'm really telling the truth. So briefly, some of the issues and pitfalls of laziness. Well, because of the way Haskell is evaluated, it can be quite hard to debug sometimes. You can't get a stack trace in the same way that you can with other languages. You can't, because of the purity, um, you, it's difficult to go, well, you can do trace statements, but there are, that's kind of cheating. Um, so it does cause uh, hassles for, for debugging, and also, you get this sort of, uh, is it the, uh, the Weinberg, was it? The, uh, when you observing something changes its behavior? Heisenberg. Yeah. Well, Heis yes. Heisenberg. Um, but because when you, when you start trying to evaluate things, you, that, when you start trying to uh, look at values, that changes the behavior. It makes things evaluate that didn't necessarily evaluate before. So it's very important to see what, what was going on when you have a, when you have a problem. There are various gotchas with lazy I.O. Um, you can, uh, because you're not really sure when file handles are uh, uh, allocated and released, you can find yourself running out of handles uh, because things are, files are still being held onto that you actually don't care about, whereas if you had explicit, open this file, read some stuff, close this file, um, it's a lot uh, uh, more predictable. And uh, there are various uh, other alternatives to lazy I.O. in Haskell, such as um, uh, enumerators and literates and all that uh, stuff. And the other thing that you get with I.O. is exceptions escaping. So you think you're, you're, you get a, an exception thrown inside your, your I.O. Uh, monad, so you've got some I.O. code and you're expecting to catch an exception, but because the thing that generates the exception doesn't actually get evaluated while where you think it does, it gets evaluated somewhere else, Actually, the, the exception handler isn't in the right place, and you end up with, with getting exceptions that get um, escape when they should be, should be caught. And there are various things about performance. It can be very hard to understand and predict performance. Uh, I've been using Haskell commercially now for about four years, and I still don't have a very good picture of how evaluation works. Perhaps that's just because I'm not very good. Um, but I, I do think that it is definitely harder to predict what's going on in a lazily evaluated uh, environment. That doesn't mean you can't use it because you just do stuff and if it's slow you start profiling, you work out what's going on and you, you, you fix problems. But I don't have, I don't find my intuition is, is always spot on as to what's going to happen. It can be very hard to benchmark and this is partly due to the debugging stuff that I was talking about earlier that, that uh, you, you, you'd write a benchmark and you see everything's really fast but actually you haven't actually evaluated anything yet. You've just got to thunk really quickly. <laughs> And this is a common, common problem. And if you look at some of the benchmarking and statistics libraries, they have all sorts of tricks to force evaluation down and, and so on. Um, and the, there are also, of course, performance costs to creating thunk. If you just evaluated things rather than creating a thunk and then evaluating it later, potentially you know, there, there's some work, there's some extra work going on there managing all that. So there is some kind of performance overhead to this. 
And it's very easy to get space leaks, things that you thought were, were evaluated and not yet evaluated, and, and therefore it, it takes up more memories while it's got all these thunks sitting around that haven't yet been evaluated when you thought it should have really gone down to a, a single value, which is related to the um, too much laziness point. And I'm going to talk a bit more about too much laziness and too little laziness in the next uh, two slides. So here's an example of too much laziness. Uh, the fold L, and this is a common Haskell newbies thing, you, you fold L uh, plus over um, a, a big list, and this is the uh, amount of maximum memory that it uses. Um, that's um, 1.7 uh, megabytes. Yes, yeah, megabytes of memory is allocated to do that. Whereas if I use the fold L prime, then it only uses um, 3.7 kilobytes. And that's because the fold L prime is the strict version, so it's actually doing the adding up as it's going rather than creating this big list of thunks and working it all out later. Of course, um, people have realized that this is actually quite inconvenient, and the compilers are pretty smart, and if you tell it to optimize with the minus O2 optimization, it turns on an optimization called strictness analysis, and this actually says, ah, I see what you're doing there, that's really stupid, I'll do it this way instead. So. Um, some of these problems are well enough known that actually the compilers can spot them and, and, and deal with them for you. So is the recommendation to use fold L or fold L prime? I'm guessing fold L. Don't know. You go prime? Depends on, I suppose partly it depends on the context, but in general I suppose if you, if you know that, that this is going to be something that you want to, uh, to be strict, I guess you might as well write that in your program. Yeah, the fold up prime is just safer. Yeah, because if you're going from the left, you pretty much always want to do this. So here's an example of too little laziness, and this one always confuses me. So suppose we have this function f, um, which what it does it it's a uh, it's, it's report. So basically, it takes a string and it's sorry, it takes a list of things that can be shown, and it uh, shows each one and on, on a separate line and adds report. Uh, uh, report line at the top. Well, let's look at the first uh, use of this. So if length of x's is greater than zero, then uh, call f on the tail of x's, otherwise call f on the whole of x's. Well, that's a pretty stupid thing to do anyway, but let's suppose that's what we wanted to do. What is the problem with that? Can anyone see a problem? What's the first problem? There's a problem with the next one as well, but can you see what the problem the first one is? Well, you can see the difference between the first and the second, so it gives you a clue where the problem is. <laughs> Go ahead. So if x is, a, is an infinite list, then clearly the uh, length of x's is going to try and force the, the whole list, which it couldn't do. Even if it's just a very big list, why force it up front to know the, know the length? We don't need to know that. All we actually care about is whether it's, if it's length, length is greater than zero, what, we're, what we really care about is, are there any elements at all? So let's just do that test. So this is always a, so, so what we've done there is uh, not have enough laziness, by f we, we forced something that didn't need to be forced. So, uh, well that's effectively what not null is saying, is are there any? So the null, null is, 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 is this an empty list? So that's, that's what it's doing, so the second line. So can anyone see what the problem with the second line is, given the third, given the third line gives, gives, gives the answer? I did try doing builds, but I couldn't quite get out to do that in here. You know. <laughs> um, can anyone see the problem with, with the second line? Um, now that's okay, because that's guarded. Uh, yeah, one, taking the tail of one element is fine, you get an empty list for that, that's fine. So, suppose we were in a uh, multi-threaded environment here, or suppose that X's was actually being read from a file and wasn't actually yet available. It's been written to by a, so it's coming from a pipe and it's being written to by another program. So the difference between the first and the second is the second and the third. In the third case, we'd get our report header straight away. Okay, it may not be valuable to us, but this is just an example. So this is just an example of where we can just rejig our program a bit just to take more advantage of laziness. So we can get some, some evaluation going on 
um, without, uh, uh, you know, even we haven't got the rest of the, uh, of the data available yet. Yeah, it's quite a subtle one that, but it's got, I think it's quite an interesting one. Oh, we don't need that. And that's almost excellent. So now we're going to um, play with some code, because I like code. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement the mastermind game. Does anybody not know what the mastermind game is? Those that were born in the last 20 years probably don't. <laughs> 30 years, maybe. <laughs> so this is a game when I was a kid. And it was called Mastermind for no obvious reason whatsoever. Um, there was a popular TV program that called, at the time called Mastermind. And I did actually, in the previous version of this, of this talk, actually have a picture of the box of Mastermind. And it's got very 70s looking people on it with a glass coffee table playing the game. Um, and basically the idea is it's a code breaker game. So, so one, one person has to uh, select uh, four uh, coloured pegs from a pool of six possible coloured pegs and put them in order and then hide it from the other person. Okay, so you've got a sequence of, of, of four pegs from a pool of possible six different coloured pegs and then the other person has to guess what those pegs are. And the way you do it is you make a guess so, you, so they will just pick you know, random four pegs, put them in, and uh, then they get a score and they get told how many of their pegs are the right colour in the right place and how many of their pegs are the right colour but in the wrong, wrong position, the right peg but in the wrong position. And the, the standard game doesn't allow any re uh, repetitions of, 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 of pegs and doesn't allow any blanks. You can extend the game, but we'll, 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 do, we'll do with the simple case. And then once you've got a score, that gives you some information. You can then make another guess based on that, on the information that you have. And you, you should be able to guess. I think six should be the maximum uh, times it takes you to, to guess. Usually it's, it's four or five. Does that make sense? Everyone understand what it is we're going to try and try and build here. Uh, you can't use the same colour twice in, in the hidden one or in the or in the yeses. <laughs> For the purposes of today, <laughs> this is the rule. I don't remember whether that's, that's how well I was used to play. I don't know whether that's that, the actual rule, but it does make it a lot simpler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cows and bulls. Is it the same thing? I've heard of cows and bulls. Right. Well, they're, yeah, they're in, in master black and, black and white, uh, little sticky peg things, yes. Um, I never understood why that was. Yeah, well, you were just obviously better at it than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I say, I have actually uh, written all the code uh, for this already. Um, done it in seven iterations. Um, Sorry, that's not it. That's the code from my talk. There's the first version. So, is that big enough for people at the back to see? Just about. You could always move forwards. <laughs> Bigger glasses. So, uh, module mastermind. Um, and uh, first thing we, we're going to do is work out about calculating the score. This is kind of pretty critical to the game to be able to calculate the score. So, I thought we'd start with that. Uh, so, uh, being a good, a good Haskell program, I've decided to create a data structure to a uh, data type for, for my score. I could just use air, of course, um, which I did in the last one. I got told off, so I created a, a data type for my, for my score called score, which has two fields, the score right pos and the score wrong pos. So, that's the number of black pegs and the number of white pegs for the older um, people in the room. Um, and uh, then a calc score function. So this, given a, a secret and a guess, so um, I've, I've created these as um, lists of, of, of tokens. Um, and I'm assuming that both lists are the same length. So I did get into trying to encode this in the type system. They had to be the same length. It just, it's a pain. It gets in the way. Um, not, not what I want to talk about today. Uh, that'll be another talk, if you like. Um, so, so yes, we have the, 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 guess, the, the, the secret and the guess. And we have to return a score with the right pos and the uh, wrong pos in it. And so we can calculate the right pos quite easily by uh, zipping the secret and the guess together. And uh, if the pin from the uh, secret is me, uh, equal to the pin from the guess, if they're the same, then I uh, add a unit to my output list. Otherwise, I don't. So the length of the list is going to be the right length is going to be 
the, length, the number of, of, of pins that I've got in the right position. Get the logic, yes? Good. Um, and here's our first example of, of laziness. It's not a very uh, um, awe-inspiring one, but we're, we're returning this uh, unit here, but we never actually use this unit. So th this won't actually be evaluated, this unit, because uh, we don't actually ever use the, the values of it. I could put uh, some complex expression. I could put the Fibonacci series in there if I wanted to, and uh, it wouldn't actually evaluate it. Uh, the... So the next line is calculating the wrong position. So this is, this is how many pegs are actually the right color but in the wrong position. Well, that is the, uh, the easiest way to do that is to actually work out how many tokens are actually completely wrong and just take that away from the, um, the, the, the length of the secret and also take away the ones which are in the right position. And the, the reason it's, it's simple is because there's a, a, a nice little uh, operator in the standard library which does this, basically it removes Everything, each, each item that appears in secret, it removes from guess, and it removes it. If we did allow duplicates, this score function still works, because it, it removes the, uh, one, for, each, for each time uh, 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 an element appears in here, it removes it once from guess. So it tells us it gets the right. This works for, for the, the more advanced game that you play. Um, so does that make sense? We understand the, the, how the scoring scoring function works, and we can actually uh, test this, prove it does actually work. So if we uh, just uh, load mastermind1, and we can say uh, score, score of um, uh, red, green, blue, yellow is the secret. And my guess is red, blue, orange, white. So that should be a score of 1-1. One, one. Excuse me. It doesn't do that. Yeah, come on. Now you can applaud. OK. So, so now we've done that, actually that gives us most of what we need to get the computer to play the secreta role. Uh, where was I going? Sorry. There, okay. So, if I want to mastermind 2, I've added, so the, the top of the code is exactly the same, just a few extra imports. So what we start doing here is we, we create a, uh, a pool, which is the possible, uh, the, 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 uh, the possible tokens. So there are six possible tokens, standing for red, green, blue, yellow, white, and orange. That's what I had in one of my sets. I had two. Um, and uh, then we calculate the universe. So the universe is all the permutations of length four from the pool. Now this should be a library function, but isn't, so I've written it. Um, and this takes the, uh, what it does is it takes all the subsequences of P, so that's all the possible um, uh, pick, picks each of the answer. So it takes the, I think it takes the empty set is one of them, and it takes each, each it gives you a list of each individual element, and then it gives a list of each pair of elements, and then a list of each triple of elements, and so on. And then we're only interested in the subsequences which are of the uh, required length, in this case four. And then what we do is we uh, take all the permutations of of that uh, uh, of each of the subsequences, and that's what we uh, we return the the, the the union of all, all of those. So we're using a uh, list comprehension. I'm assuming everybody here has some Haskell knowledge and knows what list comprehensions are, that sort of stuff. Um, if not, apologies. That's everything. Um, so does that make sense? The perms function. So we've got our universe, and uh, then we're going to choose a secret. And so choosing a secret, and we're going to use the we're going to do this in the I/O monad because we uh, want to uh, uh, use the random number generator. And those of you that know about random number generator, Haskell, you have to do this uh, because you can't have any side effects. You have to get a new random number generator each time you pick a random number. And you can hold on to that in the, in the IO monad. And that kind of wraps it up for you and makes it nice and easy. So we're just doing uh, random RIO to choose a number between 0 and the length of the universe minus 1. And then we return the um, 
ith element of the, of, the, of the universe. So Spot's example of laziness number two, which is that we're only picking a particular uh, element out of, the, uh, uh, out of the universe, and so we don't actually have to calculate the entire universe. We only have to uh, know, we do have to know how many elements there are in the universe to know how big our set of things we can choose from is. Um, there, were, there are ways, of course, of choosing a random set of four tokens from a, from a pool, but this, um, uh, we need the universe again later on, so I've actually wrote it like this. Make sense? Yes? Happy? Good. So then, uh, how do we actually play the game as the secretor? Well, we have to choose a secret. Um, and this, this structure is a bit complicated, I'm afraid. <laughs> Flip of fix. Uh, basically, what this allows us to do is to have a function that uh, is optionally allowed to call itself. So I could have just named it, but I thought I'd write it in line like this using flip or fix because I'm <laughs> obscure like that. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea last night, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so in this case, what, what it does, it has a, a, a value which gets passed, um, passed, passed along. So um, the idea is we have this, so it gets given, the so lambda here gets given a loop and number of guesses. And loop is itself that it can call onto if it wants to loop. <coughs> And number of guesses is the number of guesses so far, which starts off at zero. And I had to put the type annotation in there because the compiler couldn't work out which uh, type I wanted, although it would actually have um, chosen integer for me. My lint complained that I hadn't made it clear what type I wanted. So there so we go. Uh, so then what do we do? We, uh, so we go around this loop, and the first thing we do is we, we put the string guess, and the, uh, we then get the guess from the user. So, that, so we're going to type in a, a, our guess. And then it's going to calculate the score using the score function and the secret that it shows earlier in our guess. Uh, it's going to add one to the number of guesses. Then going to print our score. And then if the score, uh, if the, the, uh, the number in the right position was four, then we've, we've, we've guessed the secret, so in which case uh, we're finished and it tells us how many guesses uh, it took. Otherwise, it calls loop and goes around the number of guesses again. So people kind of... Flip fix does, even if you don't actually know why it's called flip fix or why that works. But you can see you can see what the code's doing. Yes, a few nods. Anybody completely confused at this point? You want any further explanation? Uh, so let's go and see if this works, and we can actually. Uh -huh. So, our guess, uh, red, green, blue, yellow. Okay, so we've got three of the right pegs in the wrong positions. So our next guess could be something like uh, orange, red, green, blue. That's worse. So, so that means that we've definitely got a yellow in there, and we definitely haven't got an orange. So that means we must have a white. So we'll go for a white, yellow, red, green. We've got one in the right position. So one of red and green is not right, and blue is right. So something like white, sorry. White, oops, yeah, so there's, there's some, I'm not quite sure why it's doing that, I think there's something wrong with my setup there. Let's try, let's ignore that, I guess. Um, white, assuming that was correct, then, um, can't put red next, we could put, uh, what, what color did we say, the blue was next, so let's go for blue there. Uh, it's got to be an orange and either a red or a green. So orange, red. No orange. No orange. So I did it wrong. Uh, does anyone know what this is yet? The we're all keen to play the game now, aren't we? Let's see. Basically orange. With yellow. White, blue, yellow, red. Yay! 
Okay. So now the next code. So uh, we've got the game now to play the secreta side. Um, I'd like to get the game to play the other side as well, so the guesser. So we're going to actually uh, start by getting it to play both sides because it's just quicker to do that. You can play yourself. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So being lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, why didn't I invent this when I was a kid? <laughs> so, uh, what do we want to do? Well, so we start off the, the same, so the scoring's all the same, the pool is the same, universe is the same, the same choosing seek. So we'll come back to yes in a minute, but we'll just look at the... Um, the idea here is that uh, we choose a secret, we then use our same weird-ass loop construct, to uh, uh, go around um, putting the string guess, which is the same as we did before. And, and now, rather than getting the guess from the user, so before we had um, guess was uh, get line, we now uh, ask it to make a guess. Now, what information does it need to make a guess? Well, for my first cut, <laughs> um, when making a, a guess, what we do as humans is we look at the whole history of what our guesses were and the scores for them. So I'm giving this thing the history in order to work out what guess to do next. So this this guesser is completely stateless. I could have made a stateful guess, and, and uh, I don't actually explore that, that, that thing here. It's perhaps how you would really do this in, in reality, but uh, for the purpose of this, we're not, going to, we're not going to do that. So in this case, we've got the history, and we'll also give it the universe, because actually we'll, uh, we need to choose guesses from our, from our universe, and you'll see how we use the universe in, in a second. Um, so then, so when we've made a guess, we then calculate its score. We add the guess and the score to the front of the history. It doesn't matter whether we add to the front or the back. The order it is, but we just need to keep the history. And uh, then we print out the guess and print out the score. And then uh, we do the same as we did previously, except instead of, uh, the, instead of our, our uh, state that's being passed around being the, the number of guesses, it's now the history. So we just have to put the, the length of the history as, as how many guesses it took. Um, and if we haven't finished, we, we uh, have to loop around with the new history. Get the idea? Yes? So if we could write such a function as make guess, we would have our, our, uh, our game playing itself. Yeah? So what does that function look like? Well, it's actually pretty small. Uh, what it has to do is, so its, it's type is, so given, given the history, which is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the sequences and the, and the score, a list of those, uh, and a universe of things to choose from, then uh, we have to return a guess. So in this case, uh, if, the, if, if there is no history, so if we haven't guessed anything, we might as well just choose the first, the first sequence out of the universe, first um, uh, guess out of the universe. If, however, there uh, is some history, then what we do is we take the first item from the history and effectively, oh, it's just shame it's gone off the screen, it's going to move over a bit. There. Uh, we take the first item out of the history and filter the universe for uh, all possible uh, 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 guesses that would have given that score. Yeah? So we know that the secret must have been something that gave that score, therefore we can throw away from the universe anything that would have given a different score for that guess. Yeah? So that gives us a, new, uh, a filtered universe. And then we call make guess again in that universe. So we just recursively trim down the universe, throwing away all guesses that it couldn't be. And then once we've got no more constraints, we hit the first clause again, and we just make the first guess that's, that's, that's available in our, in our new universe. Get the idea? Because that's, of course, what you do in your head. <laughs> <laughs> no, no really just that in your head. Um, but it seems to, seems to work quite, quite neatly here. Um, so, um, not very long actually. No, this, uh, I wrote it a while ago. Um, so it's, it took me, well last, last night when I rewrote it, it, it took me uh, a little while to remember how to do it because I wanted to express it in a way that actually works well with what I'm going to do next. Um, and that took me actually about half an hour to figure out how to, how to do that. But when I, to write this originally, 
um, was actually was actually pretty quick, um, which is what gave me the idea for, for doing this in, in the laziness talk. Because of course, there's laziness going on here. We don't really have to filter the entire universe. All we have to do is filter it to the point where we've actually got something that, that goes through all the filters. So that what's really going on is it's just crossing off each element of this. And as soon as it comes to one, it doesn't cross off. It returns that. It doesn't have to go any further. Yeah? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, once, once there's no more constraints, it just uses the first thing. Yes? Um, no, because that wouldn't have given the same score, unless it was a correct guess, in which case it would give the same score of four. It uses, it uses the results that it gets passed back in, but, it's, but it has to redo the filtering of the universe each time. Correct. So, it, so that's, that's what the, the main loop down, down here collects up the main result, all the, all the incorrect guesses with their scores in the history and passes that in that's just off the bottom of the screen. Down here. So down passes it to make guess history. So this history is sorry, nasty colour. Passes all the, uh, the the previous results. Does that make sense? Yes. No, that it doesn't give it extra information that can't be the correct secret that wouldn't have given you the inf given it the information it has. Because they would not. That because they would yeah, yeah. Why, how does that how does that work there, there is a reason I figured this out last night it because it If that was the correct answer, it wouldn't have given it wouldn't have given the score. But it, but it's scoring it's scoring against the correct answer. So not scoring against the real answer. It's scoring against. So it's, let's take the guess the guess that I just made and score it against itself. That's going to give me a score of four. That's not the score I got. So therefore, that's wrong. Yeah. I will publish this code afterwards, so play with it. Is your mind bent yet? Because it gets worse. <laughs> okay, let's show. Uh, what's that, number three? <laughs> Oh, I got in three that time. It was a lucky one. <laughs> okay? Believe it. It's much better than me at guessing, I have to say that, yeah. In fact, it's better than all of us put together. <laughs> <laughs> The, se the secret is randomly chosen. <laughs> you, you could you could write it like that. It's true. It's got it's, it's the it's random I/O, so it's it's uh, it's the, the seed is is not reset each on each run. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, probably. Yeah, it's not it's not big. 
can look at that after. So let's get to the get to the end. <laughs> um, okay, so people are happy with that? Yes, understand it. Right. Um, now, what do I want to do next? So uh, we've got the the, the game uh, playing itself there, uh, but there's an inefficiency in this that I don't like. The fact is, it has to re trim the universe on each on each step. Okay, so I, so step back. Did everyone spot the third example of laziness there, which was the the the, the guesses the only uh, the, the when it's trimming down its universe, it only has to trim as far as finding the next one. So that's that's my third example of laziness. Utilizing laziness. Okay, so go back to this. So so we don't like the fact that it's having to recalculate uh, retrim the universe on every uh, on every turn. So uh, how could we do it better? Well, the answer is obviously to use circular programming. <laughs> so, what we do is, rather than in the... Up here, so if you look at the make guess, what we, what we get given here is the history and the universe, and we have to make a guess. So, what if we didn't get given the history... What we got given was a list of scores for the guesses we haven't yet made. Okay, so we're going to return a list of guesses. One of our inputs is going to be the, the list of scores for those guesses. <laughs> because this is the obvious way to write this. <laughs> so let's, let's, try, let's try and draw this here. So we've got, so we've got uh, what was it, make guess. Is that what I called it? Or secret was it called? Make guess in this case. Make guess. Um, so that's going to uh, give out a list of, uh, of guesses. And that's going to be um, given to uh, the scorer. So um, it's actually a map of calc score. That's this. Calc score. And that's going to give a list of scores, which we're going to use as one of the inputs to make guess. Okay, so you remember how we did the cat and mouse thing, where we used the kind of the value of, of, of one thing to, to create the other thing? We're kind of doing the same here-ish. Yeah, so we're using, in order to produce a list, taking in a list, but that list couldn't have been produced until we've actually... Because the key here is that we're able to first guess without looking at the scores. If we couldn't do that, this wouldn't work. Yeah? This is mind-bending stuff. Okay. So, shall we have a look and see what that looks like? Um, number four. Number four, so our, I've called a guess secret now instead of make guess because it's kind of... So look at the type chart. We get given a list of scores and, a, and our universe and produce a list, of, a list of strings. And the code actually is not that much different, which is weird. So uh, the difference is, firstly, uh, this case actually never gets used, but I thought we'd do it anyway. So basically, if we ran out of universe, we can't make any more guesses. Should never happen because the guess must be from the universe. The, 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 Secret must be from the universe. So if, if the opponent was cheating, uh, <laughs> okay. And then uh, what we need to do is, um, given so before we, we took the uh, first uh, guess and uh, uh, the previous guess and score, we took that that in, we pulled that off the list, and we used that to trim the trim the list down over here, trim the universe down. So we're doing the same thing here, except this time we only got the score. We haven't got the guess. But the guess that score is against is the first guess that we make, which is this first G that we're returning here. So as long as we return the G before we recurse into here, we're fine. Okay? There is another little caveat, which is that when we pattern match here, if we pattern match on, uh, S colon H, then that says, okay, before we can go any further, we need to check that the scores we're getting has a cons node, it's not, a, not an empty list. Well, we know it's not going to be an empty list, 
because it's going to be basically the same length as the number of guesses we produce. But the compiler doesn't know that at the runtime, whatever. Haskell doesn't know that, and therefore we need to tell it, we're going to pattern match on this, but I've put this irrefutable pattern symbol in here. So that means we're going to pattern match on it, but don't actually pattern match it yet. Just assume it's going to match that pattern, and we'll worry about it later. We're being lazy on this pattern match. Yeah? And we need to do that, because otherwise, if we try pattern matching this without, without this, then it says, oh, well, I need to check that the list you're giving me has actually got at least one element in it, and that list hasn't actually been produced yet because it doesn't know that you've got any, any guesses. So it can't map in this map here, mapping the, 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 the scoring, it can't actually produce the value yet until you've produced a guess. So just by putting this tilde in here, this delays the, the pattern match until I actually need it later. Yeah? And this bit over here is exactly the same. I haven't changed the end of the line. People see how this works? What's going on here? I'll scroll right anyway, just to prove it. Uh, secret, secretly put anything on the end of the line. <coughs> oh, where is it? So here. A bit longer because it's got some other stuff on it. This was this was fine before I I could break the line. It's a good idea. If only I had a text editor. Actually, it wasn't a good place to break the line. Uh, where is a good place? Whatever. Oops. <laughs> there. I just wanted to put it under the bit that's relevant. There you go. Sorry? What did you, what did you want me to do? Well, break it here. Are we happy now? Oopsie. Yes? Now the actual scores against the real secret is the input list. The, the, this, this, this first input here, this list of scores, these are the actual scores. That's the point. These are the actual scores. These are the scores that are being given, given over here by my, by my scorer. My, my, my secreta, yeah, who does the scoring. Do we get this? In a vague sense? Um, yes, I could. It just gets a bit messier. So I could just uh, match on scores here and then take head of scores and tail of scores uh, elsewhere. Because the head and the tail aren't executed until I need them. Whereas the pattern match normally would be executed at the time of pattern matching. So every no, because because I'm, I'm so when I call it at the top level, it calls from so I only call it I only call guess secret once because remember it returns the whole list of guesses now. So I call it initially with the whole universe, but then when I recurse into it, I'm trimming the universe down. And each time I recurse in, I'm producing one more guess. Which the, um, which is the uh, head of the uh, of the remaining universe on, on the recursive call. So I think it's interesting when you get home when I publish this code, have a look at these two versions to see how similar they actually are. And it feels like a sort of difference between the recursion co-recursion thing, but I couldn't quite describe it. Okay, see it working. Oh, no, I can show you the, the, how to change the rest of the code to, to make that work. So um, down here, I had to change play both. So what play both now does is it chooses a secret. It then gets all the guesses by calling guess secret with the scores and the universe. And the scores is mapping calc score with the secret. So I forgot that bit uh, over, the, over the list of guesses. So these two are the, this is the circular bit that I drew on the, draw on the board over there. Okay, so um, then history is then a zip of the guesses and the scores together, and then what I do is just um, just loop over the history. So actually, all the work's actually done up here. Well, it's not really because it's done lazily down here when it's needed, but kind of the, the the plumbing work's all done up there. And then here, all I do is just go around 
with, the, with each guess and score, printing guess, printing the guess itself, printing the score, and then uh, I know that uh, once it's finished, I know I'm definitely done. Uh, because if I even manage to, uh, yeah, when, when I'm finished, I'm done, I'll just show the length of the history again. Okay? And this is number four, so. Yeah. You're also impressed now, come on. <laughs> it, it's it knew enough to to know what couldn't be there and just happened to it. The universe is ordered, yes. I could I I, I did think about randomizing the, the, the Yeah. Yeah it does because it just takes the first one. If you remember what it's doing, it takes the head of the universe. Yes, choosing the secret from the universe. Yeah, I did think about randomizing the universe, but it just gets in the way. You could you could work out what the last one is in the universe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, now what do we do next? Well, uh, there's more. There's more. <laughs> it gets worse. It's going away. <laughs> Come on, you should know me by now. It gets worse. So uh, what I wanted to do now was to uh, allow the computer to play just the guesser part. So we all do the scoring, and the computer to do the guesser part. So we've got a bit of interaction. So now I'm going to throw interaction into the mix of the um, uh, with, 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 with the circularity. So we've got the fourth example of laziness, of course, was the was the the uh, the, the feeding the circular bit. Yeah, it's done. You get that. Right, so let's move quickly on to number five. So basically what I do here is I keep the um, where was it? Uh, shoot, the, uh, the guest secret is exactly the same as we, we saw in the previous version. And the plumbing is pretty much the same except instead of the scores Sorry, plumbing down here is exactly the same. Except instead of the scores coming from mapping um, the um, um, uh, mapping the, 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 the score function, we're actually getting that from from, from the user. But so we're, we're using lazy I/O to do this. So this is the fifth example of laziness: lazy I/O. You'll see. <laughs> Skeptics in the room. Um, so we're using lazy I/O. So what we do is we get the whole contents of the of the of standard in in this get contents at the, at the beginning. And then we break it up into lines, and we map read over each line. Okay, <laughs> we're doing all this up front. <laughs> well, at least we're we're expressing it up front, and then all the rest of the stuff is exactly the same. Okay, so let's just see this one. Which <laughs> one? <laughs> Oh no! I, I put a particular read. I put uh, my own read. Yeah, so I should have said that. I put my own read. It just takes two numbers separated by a space. Yeah, so I forgot to forgot to mention that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so Colonel L, that was uh, five. I wanted yes. And play, yes, sir. Well, it chooses it. it um, so yeah, so ours is what? O W Y. You just want to take a long time, don't you? <laughs> but before that, we've got a bit of a problem. <laughs> we have to give a score before it's actually given us a guess. <laughs> now, this is an example of what I called earlier not enough laziness, <laughs> because it's waiting for us to type something before it will do. And it took me a little while to figure this out. So, can anyone look at the code and tell me why it's wrong? <laughs> we make up the secret, <laughs> but we don't. We can't give a score because we don't know what the guess is. Uh, what, what I will say, actually, sorry, if I go back to here a second. So, if I uh, we know it's, we know what the guess is, but, but so if I just start typing a score one, for example, now it gives me the guess. So it needs me to type at least a character before it gives me a guess. Now, why is that? 
Uh, da, 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 da. Can anyone look at this and tell me why I've got not enough laziness here? What is, what is being not lazy enough? Pattern matching somewhere, yes, true. Pattern matching. No, nope. lines is not, lines is fine. Zip is your problem. Because in order to zip, it needs to know whether you've reached the end of either of the lists yet. So it has to say for each list in order to do the zip, have I got an element of this list and have I got an element of this list? And the scores doesn't know whether it's got an element yet because you haven't typed anything. Okay, so how do we fix this? No, same problem. Yeah, it takes both sides. Okay, so the, the way we get around this is we write our own zip. <laughs> With an irrefutable pattern on the, on the second list here. So it says, don't worry about that, it'll be fine. <laughs> and, uh, and, and off it goes. Um, and this, this, in fact, does work, which is number six. So um, can we choose a secret? Play? Let's, let's not choose the last one in the list. Cause <laughs> something, something beginning with R, maybe. <laughs> uh, play. Uh, play. Uh, um, what do I want to do? Uh, guesser. So now, quite nicely, it gives us. Eh? So if we do something like. So what's 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 our guess going to be? So we'll write it up on the board here. R G Y B. R G Y B. That's three one. Two two. G R B Y. What's the score for that one? Zero four. Okay, but there's more. <laughs> Just one more. Um, so I, I didn't really like the idea that we had to rewrite a zip. Um, so I was able to reorganize this slightly without using a zip in here. So this, everything else is the same except play guesser is, is just a little bit different. So here, basically, it doesn't zip, it only puts the guesses in here and it just prompts for a score, but we don't actually, it doesn't actually uh, reprint the score. So it didn't need to, to, uh, to it didn't need the circularity stuff. Um, so if we just do that, seven. And if we do, should we do the same guess again? Just saves me going over there and writing another one. <laughs> um, so what were our scores? It was 2-2, two, two, wasn't it? Uh, G-L-B-Y. That was 0-4. Oh. <laughs> How did that happen? I'm confused how that happened. It didn't do that. <laughs> that's not. That's not true. Have I done something so wrong? Guesses. Because there was nothing else that could be. Uh, is that really the last one? 
What is it? The bottom? That's the only thing. Or it's all switching. So if, if you change the code up there, so <laughs> you have, if, if you get to the end, when you get to the empty list, it's right. not return the empty list, but it return a list saying boo or something. Actually. Right. Then, then it will, then it will produce one more guess. Yeah. yeah. If you cheat, yeah. you will get the Okay. I vaguely believe that. <laughs> Where's this? Guess uh, equals guess super equals universe. Yes, equals guess equals universe. Yeah. Yeah. And then in brackets, final string of Whatever. That's got things from the actual set. Never mind. Doesn't matter. Okay. So you reckon that's gonna that's gonna work? Is it? So we'll tr play the same game again. So let's try. So it's two, two. Zero, four. No. Because I think the function is still finished, therefore it's never going to use the scores again. Okay. Anyway, with that little cow. <laughs> um, <laughs> just ship it. <laughs> yes, yes, it's got the extra one on the on the list. Uh, mm. I don't know. We could we could probably we could probably figure this out. But anyway, um, anyway, so I hope that has shown you that uh, using laziness um, is clearly a very useful uh, thing to do. But no, it, it does it does allow us to write things in in ways. Uh, which we couldn't do if we didn't have laziness. And that was really the, the point of, of what I to show here. Uh, so thank you very much, and hope it was uh, useful, and I will publish the code up. <laughs> are, are there any questions other than about the mastermind game itself? <laughs> Why, why it was faster like that? Well, no, well, how, how are you going to read it? Well, basically, it just needs to... Yeah. We wrote it, we, we, we ran it with Quicksort ourselves, and it's not as, not as good as this. this is, I think this is Merge Sort. I think this is better, better than Quicksort. It only has to. I I ran it a few times. Yeah. It does work. You can try it yourself. <laughs> it does. It does work. Could have been, but they have. Ch they did change to. Yeah. I haven't tried doing the last. The last. Yeah. Could if you if you did the wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was running with a random set of numbers, by the way. Yeah. That was the standard sort from the Haskell Library. Yeah. Which was better than the quick sort I wrote. Um, experience really is what you, 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 the more you do it, the more you sort of learn about where these things sort of, sort of help. I mean, the, the, the you know, if you know you're going to need something. So, for example, the, what we were saying earlier about the the uh, the, the uh, fold L prime, you know, you know that you're going to need to expand these things, so you might as well make that make that strict. So it's those sorts of uh, of examples that, that you're sort of saying, well, yeah, I can see that I'm going to have to 
builds up, for example, you can think about sort of, it's a bit like adding cut points in prologue. If you've done any, any prologue, you kind of think, you know, I know that I'm not going to have to go back past this. I don't want to go back past this point and cut here. Once I found this, I know I'm right. So you, you can do that. So it's, it's those sorts of, of ideas. But I don't know if other, other experienced Haskells have any suggestions on sort of approaches. Yeah. So, so Haskell doesn't use stack frames the same as, a, as an eagerly evaluated language does. Effectively, what, it, what it's doing, it's only going in far enough to get the first piece of the result out. So you kind of get this different problem, which is the, all these thunks building up rather than the, 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 the stack frames. And it's, I think, I seem to remember there's a difference between, if you, if you do, if you, do, um, if you fold, fold R plus over a list, you get a different kind of blow up to if you fold L plus. One, one uses stack and the other one uses thunks, is that right? Or something along those lines. Is the stack, yeah. Because, because the, the problem with doing a fold R of plus, and it, it, this is a useful one to kind of work through yourself actually, thinking about how fold R and fold L evaluate. Because fold R can't produce any result until it's got kind of all the way down, which is why you use up stack frames, whereas the fold L can produce the kind of the top level what I've got to do is the plus, the plus thing. It, de um, it depends what your, yes, what, what you do because, because fold R, yes, because fold R comes, it works that way, yes. So it does depend on what you're trying to, to do. But if, if it's something that needs to use both sides, it's because comms doesn't, comms is, cause is, is lazy in its, in, in its children. Whereas plus needs to know the value of its children to be able to actually produce anything. Does that, does that vaguely make sense? But if you, if you can kind of think about how you would evaluate the fold L of plus and fold R of plus, you can sort of see the, the difference between them and that, that give you some perhaps intuition about the difference between thunks and, and stacks.